Okay, as you may notice, I'm wearing a jacket <laughs> for Sergio. And maybe for your 75th birthday workshop, I might even consider a tie. <laughs> so, um, at the end of my talk, I will, if I have time, say a few words about my collaboration with Sergio, because I have done work with him. Um, but first, let me do the technical part. So I will be talking about identifiability of dynamical networks, and I will present uh, a series of results, some of which are from the last six months or so. And this is joint work with Alex Bazanella, with whom I've been working for about 10 years. I go to Brazil once or twice a year. And with Julien Hendricks, who is a, a junior colleague at uh, Louvain. I will first give some motivation for why do we study uh, networks of dynamical systems. And then I will talk about the problems of identification of networks. And I will. Um, show you that essentially there are three main topics in this area. Um, identifying the whole network and its topology. Identifying the whole network when you know the topology. Or identification of a single embedded module. And I will uh, finish with some present research questions. And this is a field that I started working on about two and a half years ago, and it's fascinating. There are so many deep and interesting problems. I, I'm very enthusiastic about the field. Oops. Why does this not work? OK. Networks of dynamical systems are everywhere. Telecommunication systems, gene networks, neural networks, economics. And they have been enormously studied in the last 15 years or so in many communities. But until recently, in most of these uh, works and, and papers, uh, it is assumed that the network is known or that it is to be designed. And it turns out that there are many applications where the dynamical links are unknown or where even the link structure, the topology, is unknown. So it's a very new subject, and particularly in our own field. Why is this not working? I'm not happy about that. We will consider uh, networks with directed links between the nodes. So we have scalar transfer functions between the nodes and then we have external uh, inputs. And such networks are full of feedback loops. Identification of such networks connects with many problems, like detecting causality in multiple time series can be seen as, as a subtopic of um, identification of networks, constructing the topology of a network on the basis of measurements, finding out which measures and which external excitation signals are needed to identify either the whole network or a particular module. So let me now become specific and describe the kinds of networks that I will be studying. And uh, in my view, the first one who started looking at these problems is Paul van den Hoff about five years ago. So what we have are a number of nodes, L nodes, and these are the node signals. They are connected to the other nodes by scalar transfer functions. So the G, I, J are scalar transfer functions, causal. And then there are two sources, possible sources of external excitation. The R1 to RL signals going through a K matrix, K matrix of transfer functions. And then a vector of noise signals on each node, which typically we can model as a transfer function H with white noise at the input. So this matrix, so in, in shorthand notation, you, you can write it as WT is G of Q applied to WT plus K applied to R plus H applied to white noise. 
G of Q is called the network matrix and we will assume that it has zeros on the diagonal that is there is no self loops from a node to itself but there can be a loop from a node to itself through going through various other nodes and also we <coughs> assume that all the gij are proper final assumption the excitation signals are i which are known signals these are the signals that we may want to apply in order to identify are uncorrelated with all the noise signals. If you look at it from a, a classical systems engineering point of view, this is an example uh, more in, in the style of a, a feedback structure. So here we have uh, one, two, three, four, six transfer functions G. We have excitation non-excitation at some of the nodes, there are five nodes all together, and we have disturbances on three of the nodes. As I said before, essentially there are three main problems. The first one is where we want to identify the whole network from measurements of all the nodes and all the excitation signals. And by that I mean finding the topology and finding the transfer functions. Second problem is where we assume that the topology is known, that is we know which links have a non-zero transfer functions and which links do not exist. And we want to identify all the transfer functions. And the third problem is where we want to identify a particular module. So, <laughs> identification of the whole network and its topology, we will make the assumption that all the nodes are measured. And so far, except for results we obtained in the last three months, <coughs> the whole literature on identifiability or identification of networks assumes that you measure all the nodes. So the kinds of questions are, what external excitation signals do, do I need in order to identify? Do the noise signals give information? Can the network always be identified from the measured signals, that is the external excitations and the nodes? Second problem, identification of the whole network with partial node measures. In that case, we will assume that the topology is known, but we only measure a subset of the nodes. And this is a, a topic we started just a few months ago. Questions there are, assume that only some node measures are available, can we identify the whole network? Or under what conditions? If not, which transfer functions can we identify? Which nodes need to be measured to identify the whole network? Which nodes need to be measured to identify a particular transfer function? And the third problem is identification of a single module. Suppose we only want to identify G12. Which signals do we need to measure? Do different combinations of measured signals yield identifiability? What external excitations do we need to apply and where? What is the degree of richness of these excitations that we need? And do the noise signals give information? So, let me first talk about problem one. Identification of the whole network and we assume that we measure all the nodes. So we measure the whole vector of W signals and we measure the external excitations where they are present. The matrix G that I showed you before, which we call the network matrix, is admissible if its diagonal elements are zero if there is a delay in every loop from node i to itself. So if we have a loop that goes from node i through various other nodes and back to node i, there has to be a delay somewhere. 
all the gij are proper and there's a, a fourth assumption we, which I forgot which is that 1 minus g uh, is a stability matrix. The question there is under what conditions can we recover these three matrices from measurements Why do you assume that the animal elements are zero? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, it, it makes our life a lot simpler. But we are considering handling the case where we don't. Okay. So the question is under what conditions can we recover these three matrices from measurements of the node signals and the external excitation. Okay. Well, the first thing we do is to convert this network model into a standard input output model. So, by multiplying by 1 minus g inverse, we can also write that the nodes are a transfer function applied to the external signals plus another transfer function applied to the white noise. And these are the expressions, I mean, this is easy and standard. So what is the question of network identifiability? One thing we know from very basic identification theory of decades ago is that from measured signals R and W, and assuming that R is sufficiently rich, we can uniquely identify T and N. Okay, we assume that a vector of noises is full rank in this paper or in this presentation. So we can find a unique T and a unique N. It's an open loop identification problem. There's a whole body of literature on that. And so the question of identifiability of the network is under what conditions can we recover the triplet GKH uniquely from TNN? Under the constraints that we have these two relationships and that G must be admissible. It looks like a hopeless problem because you want to go from three L by L matrices from two L by L matrices to three. We know we can go from the network to the input output model and the problem here is this mapping uh, invertible. And the only thing we know is that G must be admissible, but is that enough? So let me give you a precise definition of network identifiability. Suppose we have, say, a true network which is parameterized with a parameter vector theta naught. And at theta naught, we have an exact description of the true network. It has a corresponding input output model, Tn, using the expressions I just showed. And then we say that this network is identifiable if there exists no different network with a different parameterization that produces the exact same TNN, but which is different in the sense that at least one of those uh, three matrices is, is different. There is an intuitive connection to indistinguishability, which is no, another way of talking about identifiability. We say that two networks, the true one say, and this other one, are indistinguishable if there exists no data set and no method that enables one to distinguish them from signals R and W. And let me show you an example. Suppose that this is the true network and A and B are transfer functions. And this is the true uh, excitation <coughs> matrix. The, so this tells you how the R affect the nodes. So we see that there is no R3 signal here. Well, the corresponding input output model for T, <coughs> we, we assume that there's no noise. The corresponding input output model for T is this one. And it turns out that this other network, G tilde, K tilde, which is different, <coughs> generates the exact same input output model. 
So if I drive both of them with the same signals, I will get the same signals at the nodes. So first result, a network is generically not identifiable. And actually we can say more, the set of all network models that produce a given input-output model is given by this triplet where G tilde is any admissible network matrix. Take any G tilde which satisfies these properties, zero diagonal elements, etc., and then generate K tilde H tilde by this uh, operation, 1 minus g tilde times t and 1 minus g tilde times n. Well, all of these network models are indistinguishable. So without prior knowledge about a network structure, any admissible g tilde defines a network that is indistinguishable from the true. In practical terms, it is often the case that we have knowledge available particularly about the excitation structure. So we might know that uh, there is some excitation on node 34 or some noise on node 12. Uh, so often we know things about the uh, excitation matrices. Result number two is a sufficient condition for identifiability. Suppose that this is the true network. It is identifiable if the matrix KH, which is L by 2L, contains L columns that are known and linearly independent. It's a sufficient condition. Sometimes with L minus 1, you have enough information. And this is the case of the example I showed before. If I know K, so here I have two known linearly independent columns. I don't, the, the theorem said a sufficient condition is three, but here with two it's enough. Then I can uniquely identify the G matrix solving this equation. This is one minus G times T is equal to K. There's a range of other sufficient conditions that have been derived in the last few years by essentially by the, the group of Paul van den Hoff and ourselves. An important observation is that network identifiability can be obtained from either the measured external signals or the noise signals or a combination of both. So let's move to problem two and this is joint work with uh, Bazanella and, and also Julien Hendricks. Now we are going to consider that we don't measure all the nodes. And so we have the network model and then we have an output vector which is CW and C is a selector matrix. Each row of C selects one node. It's a difficult problem that hasn't been treated before so we simplified our first analysis of this by assuming that uh, there is an external excitation on each node and there is no noise. Okay, so in the, f in the future, f f next few slides, I assume that there is an external excitation on each node. So let me uh, go back. This is the model. W is G applied to W plus excitation. Um, and you can write this as W is T times R with T, this expression. And then we have the measurement equation, Y is CW. We know that CT0 can be uniquely identified from Y and R data. And so the network identifiability question with partial node measurements is, which nodes do I need to measure, that is which C, such that by knowing CT0, which is equal to C1 minus G inverse, I can uniquely recover G. Okay? I know that CT0 is C times 1 minus G0 inverse. Under what conditions is this 
an equation that gives me a unique solution for g equal g naught. Just as an appetizer, suppose we have this network. It has six nodes. There are eight unknown transfer functions. There are two sources, W4, W6. These are nodes that don't have any incoming links. And there is one sink, this node here, that has no outgoing edge. It so happens that for this network, we can identify all the, the eight unknown transfer functions by measuring node five and any one of nodes one, two, or three. So with two nodes, we can identify everything rather than measuring six nodes. Our main result on this is the following. Consider the transfer functions from a node i to all its out neighbors. So this is an example, wi, and consider the transfer functions in red here from wi to its three out, no out neighbors. Let C be a set of measured nodes, and in this case, we will take these three as measured nodes. Then all these red transfer functions can be identified from the measured nodes if and only if there exists vertex disjoint path from the out neighbors to the measured nodes. So here we, you see that from this one, the first out neighbor of WI, there is a path to W7. From this one, there is a path to W8. And from that one, there is a path to W9, and they don't intersect. Oops, too fast. Main result number two, the whole network can be identified from a given set of measures if the condition that I just showed applies to every node. And there is an algorithm that can check this in order of NL square operations, where N is the number of unknown transfer function and L is the number of nodes. An important open problem is I have my network. Which are the nodes I need to measure to identify the whole network. So the result we have so far is I have a set of measured nodes. What can I identify? <laughs> Problem number um, three, identification of just one embedded module. And, and Paul and his group started working on this problem. This is the first problem they addressed about five years ago. This raises a number of questions about identifiability and informativity. What signals do I need to measure to identify just G12? Do we have different possible choices? Which excitation signals need to be applied? And what are the degree of richness that we require from these excitations? Now, an important observation about this is that you can view the network, you can rewrite it as a multiple input single output feedback system where the output is W1, which is the, uh, the signal here, and the input is all the other nodes, signals. So if I take a three node network, I want to identify G12, I can rewrite it as W1 is G12 W2 plus G13 W3 plus the external excitations, and then the feedback, which is this expression. And we have a body of literature about closed loop identification, which we can apply. These results on closed-loop identification have been used by, by Paul Vandenhoff and his group to derive a number of results about direct prediction error identification of G12 using the first equation. 
But the problem is that they need an assumption that says that the vector of all the node signals is informative. And that is an internal constraint. And so an open problem is, what are the conditions on the external signals that allow one to identify this specific embedded module? This is an experiment design problem. So in uh, March, I think, I was swimming in a, the hotel swimming pool in Porto Alegre, and I was thinking about this, and I found a, a solution using the methodology I just showed. And I, the, the solution solves all three questions. Which nodes to excite, which nodes to measure, and how to compute. And I think I will skip the details. And I will just illustrate. Suppose you want to identify this link here the transfer function from W2 to W3, then what, yet what you need to do is excite nodes 1, 2, and 3, and measure nodes 1 and 3. So 1 and 3 are the uh, out neighbors of node 2. You need to measure the out neighbors of node 2, and you need to excite uh, at these out neighbors, but also at W2. It, and it's a very simple solution. Conclusion, identification of dynamical networks is full of challenging problems. My, my feeling at this point is that it has worked for 10 years. There's so many interesting questions. The major questions are about identifiability of the network structure and informativity of the data. Which nodes do we need to excite with what degree of richness? So far, all the results assume that all nodes are measured, and so we have presented the first results for the case where not all the nodes are measured. And this has given us a simple solution for the identification of a single module but many open problems remain. So this concludes the first part of my talk, so I need another half hour to do the second part. Oops. So, happy birthday, Sergio, and thanks for all you have done for our community, and I have a small gift for you. Thank you very much. I, I hope you like classical music. But let me just say a few words about my collaboration with Sergio. We haven't published any joint papers, but we have worked a lot together when Sergio was the chief editor of the European Journal of Control. <coughs> and I have never seen a person so dedicated to the success of this journal. Now, in 2006, we embarked on a very ambitious project, which was to publish a special issue on, say, the history of control viewed by a number of senior people, each one in, in their respective countries. And these people were uh, Ostrom, Brockett, Fossard for France, Guardabassi for Italy, Han Fu Chen for China, Kurzansky for Russia, Maine, and Willems. So we sent out an invitation to submit a, a section uh, and we, we gave a few hints, like, you know, we would like to know how control first started in your country and who were the what were the important steps and the important people who contributed. And after a number of months and a number of reminders, as you would expect when you address the, those high-level people, we got all the, the, uh, the, the contributions. And they were all kind of in the mold that we had expected and, and hoped for, except one, Carl. <laughs> While most people had sent like, you know, 10 to 20 pages, he sent us 45 pages. And it was 
absolutely fascinating reading, but frankly, for a Swedish audience. Because Karl's contribution was to say, well, you know, in Sweden, the, the people who have been driving are people from industry. And so he was quoting all these names of people, and we thought, but nobody has ever heard of these names in the international community. So the readers, <laughs> hmm? so the, the readers of European Journal of Control, uh, you know, they, they won't connect to these people. So we thought, what do we do? And Sergio said to me, you know, Carl, I mean, he's like God. You can't tell God that he didn't do a perfect job. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I agree, he, he's like God. But uh, maybe we can explain to him that he's a bit out of scope. So we had a long discussion. And in the end, Sergio said, OK, Michel, go for it. So I wrote this long email to Carl. And I said, you know, there's this problem and this problem. Would you agree to kind of retune your contribution? And you all know Carl. I mean, he said, of course. And in fact, he, he wrote to us, I don't understand why, why you're so bashful to give criticism. Because we said, you know, it's, we're, we're hesitant to criticize. And he continued by saying, it's the only way to get good papers. <laughs> so we got a second version, which was just great. <laughs> and that, that collaboration, in my view, is one of the better things I, I've done. Because, I mean, this was a fantastic project. It was Sergio's idea. And I believe the end result was really great. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you.